for making sure that uh, Mr. Peterson is heard. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Facebook Live event dedicated to our response to the COVID pandemic. This will be our sixth town hall on the subject, but today's event is unique because it is dedicated to the DOD civilian employees working on the installation. Fort Meade has more than 56,000 employees and a vast majority of them are DOD civilians. We are also home to more than 115 tenant organizations that represent every branch of service and also other government agencies, including the EPA and the architect of the Capitol. This diversity means our civilian workforce has a unique set of challenges. Today, we are bringing together experts to help answer some of the general questions you may have regarding COVID and how it impacts your job. However, we will not be able to answer agency or organization specific questions. That is why it's imperative for you to keep in close contact with your individual HR departments and leadership. You are also encouraged to visit the opm.gov or to visit opm.gov for updated information. Okay. What we will do, what we will do today is answer what we can the best we can. We will also work to answer unanswered questions in the active thread. So please continue to ask your questions in the Facebook thread and we will work with the appropriate organizations to get a response within, within the thread during the next 48 hours. All questions asked today on both the thread and here during the, the live session will be saved on the Facebook page. We are also recording this town hall so that we can save it in different formats in case you are unable to access Facebook. Today's town hall will be dedicated to civilian employee issues. We know that there will probably be other questions that come up in our regular town halls and if you ask them in the threads, that is fine. However, those questions will be answered at a later time, and I encourage you all to attend our next general Facebook Live event on Friday, 5.30 p.m., again with Colonel Sprague and Colonel Brooke over at MEDAC. Now, on to our panel. Well, first, how this is going to work, we're going to introduce the panel. After the introductions, then each panel member will have a, a couple minutes for opening. Then we'll get into questions. After we get some questions answered, then we'll, we will allow for uh, closing comments from our panelists just to ensure you're getting the best information you can. And the expectation is this event will run close to 30 minutes. So first, via telephone, encouraging social distancing, is our Deputy Garrison Commander, Mr. Gunnar Peterson. Directly to my left is Dr. Steph Williams, who is the Director of Fort Meade Civilian Personnel Advisory Center. And on the far edge of the table is Mr. Jeffrey Dozier, the Chief of Administrative Law for the Fort Meade Staff Judge Advocate. With that, Mr. Peterson, the uh, floor is yours for any opening comments. Okay, good afternoon. I, um, this is a little awkward, I think, for me to do this by phone, and I hope everybody can hear me, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that we are trying to be as flexible as we can and respond as quickly as we can to the rapidly changing guidance that is coming out from higher headquarters. Um, you only need to follow the news to know how quickly things are changing, both in our local community and across the nation. We have to all keep in mind that we are, as federal employees, many of the things that we can and can't do uh, have their basis in law, in Title V of the U.S. Code. So. Even though we're looking to apply as many flexibilities as we can, there are certain things that we cannot do. So we have been very flexible within the garrison, and I can only speak specifically for garrison employees. But since this started, we have been very flexible in the definition of mission essential employees and who can telework. As I said at the last time I spoke, we were not really prepared for this in terms of telework. We don't have the equipment, there aren't enough VPN accounts, and there are other obstacles that people are teleworking. 
not everybody can do their job by telework and, and work from home, and I used examples of like our drivers. But we have to continue through this and just remember that you can be mission essential, but you can still be teleworking. We just need to make sure that we're being productive when we telework. I myself right now am teleworking because of my age. but uh, And I know it's difficult to do, but you can be productive. And I encourage all of you who are teleworking to be checking with your supervisor and make sure you're doing the right thing and you continue to keep the mission moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Williams? Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Steph Williams. I'm the director at the Fort Meade CPAC. And within the CPAC, business is as usual. However, the staff, majority of the staff, is working remotely. Although currently there is a stop movement um, with regards to new hires, employees coming to Fort Meade, that basically means that if there's a PCS involved, right now the Department of Defense has put a stop movement people aren't able to uh, report to their new job. However, if individuals are in the local commuting area, we are in processing them and bringing them on board. We're doing it remotely. We're being very creative um, with the in-processing. For instance, if someone needs to take the oath of office, we're doing it through Skype, through FaceTime, and other, um, other ways. There are some um, delays with EOD dates, start dates. Um, if someone needs to have a physical done or fingerprints taken in, in situations like that, there are some delays in the start dates. My recommendation is to be speaking with your hiring officials as well as your um, servicing HR specialist, whoever that individual is that extended the job offer to you. So that's pretty much what's going on the, in the CPAC right now. Thank you. Mr. Dozier. Thanks, Chad. Uh, my name is Jeff Dozier. Uh, when I was first asked to come here today, I thought it was going to be mostly Garrison employees. So I now understand that it's really open to anyone who wants to watch us today. So I would ask that uh, you all kind of take into consideration that I'm really a Garrison attorney and I deal with the Fort Meade Garrison a lot. And so my answers will be related to Garrison matters and not Army worldwide or Army even continental in the incumbents, continentally. Um, I am the Chief of Administrative Law, which means I provide advice to supervisors and managers concerning things which are non-criminal and non-personal injury. It includes contract law and labor law and environmental law and ethics and things of that nature. Um, dealing with personnel matters, whether appropriated fund or non-appropriated fund, is also within my area, and I work with Steph and her folks. Uh, on a daily basis to make sure we do the right thing. I've been here since 1984, and um, I mention that because many of the people in the garrison already know me. Many of you have uh, dealt with me. Many of you have had the ethics trainings, which we do all, all the time. And so I want to share with you all that I've been here for at least four significantly important events for the garrison over the years. Uh, the first one was the BRAC of 1988. When BRAC 1988 came along, they thought about even closing Fort Meade, but we're still here. The next one was when um, the Iron Curtain fell, when the Soviet Union fell. And some people thought there's really no need for many of the things which went on in Fort Meade, and they thought about moving things and closing Fort Meade back in uh, uh, roughly 1990 when the Iron Curtain fell. I was here for Desert Shield, Desert Storm, when uh, the, pay, the Fort Meade was a mobilization site and we were responsible for getting all sorts of soldiers mobilized to, to go to war. And then, of course, I was here for 911 when the world really did change again. I think this is the biggest change that I've seen of those five changes, because today, with regard to COVID-19, is certainly our biggest change. And uh, I think with regard to COVID-19, we'll survive it as we survived uh, these other four events, which made a significant difference in the, in the life of Fort Meade and the people who work on Fort Meade live on Fort Meade. Um, I think my takeaways from those events and this event is something that uh, Mr. Peterson was saying, that we're often not totally prepared for things. Army personnel are not psychic, they're not clairvoyant, they always try to prepare for the next event, but uh, history teaches us the next event always has some additional things that, that we're not expecting. Um, but what it does reveal, I think, is that there are people out there working for the Army, in the Army, 
who are little diamonds. In other words, we don't know they're there because day in and day out they go through their jobs and they don't really uh, get a lot of recognition. But then when something significant happens and life changes, those people come to the forefront and are really, really wonderful people who make things happen. Uh, for Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we used to have a Directorate of Logistics. And the Directorate of Logistics was somewhat floundering. And so the commander at the time saw that the in-place leadership was floundering and chose three other individuals from within the Director of Logistics to come to the forefront and make sure things happened. So if this is like in the past, people will come forward to make things keep rolling and happening. So I'm, I'm totally confident of that. Um, and also, I learned that the Army is really good at improvising. There are a lot of jokes of, about the Army during the Cold War about why we were so good at war. And so you can probably look those up on Google or Bing or, or some other search site. But the Army does, even in chaos and even in changing conditions, seem to uh, find the way to go forward. And I think we will this time as well. Routinely in my job, I provide advice to supervisors and managers. I don't provide advice routinely to individuals. There is one area that's really different, though, with regard to the advice that I provide and the folks I work with provide. And that's with regard to ethics. I kind of have this rule of three, right? whereas I think most people don't really, don't really hold more than three projects, three thoughts, three things in their mind at a time. So when I teach ethics, I always try to teach three principles about how you should behave, and if you behave this way during a crisis, you'll be okay and everything will be okay. Um, the first one is uh, when you're doing something, always be sure you're confident about telling your boss. You never want to do something in your job where you don't tell your boss or not, you're afraid to tell your boss what you're doing. If you don't feel like you can tell that person, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Also, you should uh, make sure that if what you're doing was revealed to the press and it was on the front page of a major newspaper above the fold, that what you're doing, you'd be proud for it to be seen by everyone. Uh, people used to laugh at me when I said that, and then I had an employee and she actually did, when she went to another agency, show up above, on the first page of the Washington Post above the fold for something going on at her agency. And the, the last one is simply don't put pennies in your pocket that the Army says shouldn't be there. And by that I mean when I was going to um, pick up all of my materials to telework, I looked around my office and I saw a hand sanitizer and I saw a roll of toilet paper and I saw some uh, printer paper. And I thought, well, maybe I should take those with me, but then I knew they weren't mine, they were the Army's, and so I left them there and they're still there. Uh, so don't use your job to get benefits which the Army wouldn't approve of you getting from your job. Uh, so um, I'm also a supervisor, and I've been a supervisor for a long time, and I'm very, very fortunate with the people who work for me. And so uh, as a supervisor, some of the things that I would like to share with everyone would be what I do with regard to my team. I try to thank my team every day for the things that they do. I thank them for providing value to the Army, and they all work real hard to do that. I thank them for seamlessly going into the telework mode. They all did that with um, great grace and dignity. Uh, no one was complaining, no one was uh, belly aching about it. They picked up their stuff. and. They started working at home, and, and I'm very thankful for all those things they did. Um, and I try to avoid overloading the folks in my office. I try to keep them from getting overloaded with news reports and gossip and things of that nature, and so I'm very, very proud of them. And that's what I think most supervisors should, should hope to do for their, for their team. So I also had a hodgepodge of thoughts. I didn't know Chad was going to have some questions prepared for us. Yeah, no, you, that was pretty... And so can I go over my hodgepodge of thoughts? Is that okay? Well, so let's say that to the end. Yeah, the end. okay. And then, because we'll, you'll get some time to close off in the end. Okay. And I was going to just say that uh, thank you for your hard work. And the only paper that really matters is the sound off on Thursday. So make sure you pick it up. And with that, because I have the first question for you already, uh, Mr. Dozier, is um, as this elevates, and there's been more talk about, you know, now where non-essential businesses are closing, and now things are in place to, well, what happens if Governor Hogan or even, I, you know, we have employees in three different states, Virginia and Pennsylvania as well, if their governors declare 
a shelter in place order, what impact does that would that have on those uh, deemed mission essential and coming in here to work on Fort Meade? Um, over the years, we've actually supported installations in Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, and so I'm a little bit familiar with their governments. And what I've perceived over the past is that their governments are always very, very supportive of the military mission. I know Maryland and Virginia are very supportive. So if there is a shelter in place concern or something issued by the governor, I'm sure that the order will take into consideration the military mission, the federal mission, the DOD mission, because you know the, the federal government is so important to the Maryland and Virginia area. Um, if I were being legalistic, I would say the federal government is, has supremacy over state governments, so if it's a federal mission, it, it, it would sort of trump any state rules or laws with regard to it. But I'm not concerned about it in Maryland, Virginia, or Pennsylvania, because I know the governors will take it into consideration. Uh, so if a government employee, there is a shelter in place order and a government employee is doing a federal mission, as long as they have their federal ID card and they're um, able to articulate to a person asking them about it, um, what it is they're doing, why they're out when they should be in, I'm 100% sure that that mission will be uh, accomplished. Outstanding. Okay. All right, now I'm going into a two-part question uh, for the panel, and Jeff, if Mr. Peterson, when he comes in, you can just remember to move the microphone down toward the phone a little bit. Okay. Uh, but this is really a two-part question per, um, in regards to mission essential employees. And it, the first part is, if on your PD, if you're an existing employee, and your PD does not state that you are mission essential, can you now, under these circumstances, be classified as a, mission, as a mission essential employee, even though your original PD does not stay it? And then as a second part of that question, if you are non-mission essential for the term, I know we, we're all essential, but if we're non-mission essential, are you still able to be relegated to telework even as a non-mission essential employee? Uh, so this is Gunnar Peterson. Let me answer the first part of that. Um, first, let me define the current definition of mission essential functions. So mission essential functions are those functions in support of the COVID-19 operation and life, health, and safety of personnel and installations. And that's a leader determination to make. So whereas we... Uh, we do have designations on our PDs that tell us whether or not we're emergency essential, mission essential. But uh, as with everything, this is a little bit different situation. So I would not worry about what your PD says. It's really what determination your supervisor is going to make as to whether or not you're mission essential. So mission essential civilian employees will continue to perform duties as instructed by their supervisor. And that's whether or not if that's your place of work, you're coming into the office as normal, or by telework. So we are going to ensure that all mitigation measures possible are being enforced. So as we have from the very beginning, we are encouraging maxim maximum use of telework, even if you don't have a current telework agreement. We do need to complete the paperwork on that, but we, we can do that once we get people settled down into their uh, alternate workplace, that is their home. There's a, there's a lot of concern about non-mission essential civilian employees, those that aren't directly related to the COVID-19 operation or life, health, and safety of the installation. So there's, there's two types here, non-mission essential civilian employees who are telework eligible or able to telework will continue to telework. And then there's the non-mission essential civilian employees who are not telework eligible. The people who just, there's nothing for them to do from a telework uh, place. They're to be placed on weather and safety leave, and this is a change as of today. They are prohibited from entering their place of duty until they're notified otherwise. Now, I'm sure that this will be spoken about more, but I'll just add that weather and safety leave is not to be used while a civilian employee is in a different leave status already. This is just like when we have weather events or something else. If you're already on approved sick leave, approved annual leave, or leave without pay, you stay in that category 
until your approved leave is up. You do not automatically convert over to whether it's safety leave. Um, what was the second part of that question, Chad? Maybe I can't answer. Uh, you, you might have, you might have hit it, but um, can non-mission essential employees be directed to telework? Uh, my answer to that is it it really depends on several factors. It depends on what your normal job is. Now, if and I have to keep going back, if everybody should know that we have drivers that we provide to NSA. Um, if you're a driver, driving your vehicle is your primary responsibility, it's your primary duty. You can't do it from telework, so we couldn't order you to telework and expect you to continue to perform your primary duty. So it, it really would come down to an individual uh, basis, but I think that the majority of people that we have are eligible to telework, even when they're in face-to-face in jobs that require face-to-face -face customer contact, there's still things that they can do without seeing the customer from a telework situation. Obviously, the, in addition to the drivers, most all of our DES personnel, the security guards, the firefighters, the police officers, the dispatchers, they would not be able to do what they do while teleworking. Um, so they're emergency essential. And we have some others. And again, it's each supervisor will make that determination. Uh, in conjunction with myself and the garrison commander, and we'll move forward from there. Thank you. Anything to add? So, um, Dr. Williams, on, on your part of that, because we're hearing a lot of um, weather leave or admin leave, can you explain a little bit on what that is? So administrative leave basically is an excused absence, and it's usually granted to the masses. So if there's a closure due to um, inclement weather, it would apply to everyone. The weather and safety leave is an aspect of admin leave. And so if you're placed on weather and safety leave, the charge on your timesheet would, would show as admin leave, but then there's another, um, another level where you would identify specific to weather and safety leave. Okay. And from, so is there a limit to how long you can be put on weather or, or admin leave in regards to for, this situation? In this situation with COVID-19, for instance, if someone needs to self-quarantine because they're asymptomatic, um, there is no limitation on how long that could be. However, I understand that it's being recommended for at least 14 days, but again, in this particular situation, there is no limit. Excellent. And then, so, Jeff, you mentioned you were a supervisor. Obviously, Mr. Peterson, he supervises me. Dr. Williams, what kind of paperwork needs to be granted? Like, you, I, I'm assuming I could not just call Mr. Peterson and say, yeah, I am self-quarantining. Give me my admin leave for 14 days. What is required from an employee to be able to get um, that in, in regards to official documentation or anything like that? <clears throat> um, Chad, I'm, I'm kind of a simple guy. Good. And so I really look at leave simply. Um, I know that if you go to our time and attendance uh, documents, we have all kinds of categories. But I kind of look at leave very, very simply. I look at it as RG for regular, or leave sick, or leave annual, or here we have um, TN, which I think is the admin leave we're using with regard to uh, weather and emergency leave. And then telework, uh, and telework situational. So with regard to um, the, 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 these, these categories, uh, you would first hope that the employee would look at them and think about it, then you would have the supervisor take a look at the categories and um, sort of default on the basis of either putting the person in RG or admin leave or sick leave as appropriate. And it all depends on what's going on. So if an individual is quarantining, self-quarantining, because they think they're exposed to COVID-19, they would be in admin leave during that period. 
but if they then discover that they had COVID-19, they would switch to sick leave. So at the very beginning, they're in an admin leave status, and then if they actually get sick, they go to sick leave status. With regard to sick leave, if people don't have sick leave, you can often get advanced sick leave. There's a different category for uh, if you're taking sick leave to care for a loved one versus sick leave for yourself. So it's a lot of flexibility there, but I use those sort of simple categories even though if you go to the time and attendance rules, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of specialty categories. Does that, that help? It does. Okay. Uh, anybody else, anything to add to that? Um, I'll add something to it. I'll augment it a little bit. Sick leave is a category. Other forms of leave can be used in lieu of sick leave if someone has exhausted their sick leave balance. There's also opportunity to apply to the volunteer, uh, voluntary leave recipient program where leave can be donated to an individual if they don't have leave um, to use. So there's other options out there available to, in, to individuals if they've exhausted their sick leave and have a need to use it. We had a little bit of technical difficulty with the phone, but I'm assuming uh, just press the answer button there, Jeff. There it is. Tell hey. it working at its finest. Hello, Mr. Peterson, are you back? I'm back. I dropped off. I'm sorry. Not your fault. It, it is what happened. We were just talking about sick leave, and uh, Dr. Williams talked about the different types of leave in regards to uh, leave without pay and the different yeah. standards of the leave that we're going I, I through. I heard that. I would just like to add to that that uh, as Dr. Williams alluded to, there are, there are different types of administrative leave. And for garrison employees, I actually all employees, I think it's extremely important that you use the correct code in ATAP to account for your status. So in the 2017 National Defense Appropriate Authorization Act, Congress put a limit of 10 days on admin leave. But if you use the code for weather and uh, safety leave, there is no limit. So under admin leave, there's four subcategories. Three of them, I believe, have to do with labor relations. And then the fourth one is weather and safety leave. So it's very important that you code it as weather and safety leave to account for any time that you take off. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're going to get into, so we have received a lot of questions over our previous town halls. Um, employees wondering if, you know, they can be made to work, and that's where part of where the leave discussion was coming in. Um, what is, if an employee feels like they are being put in an unsafe work environment, what is the official, you know, what are, what are some of the things they can do officially, grievance processes, potentially working through units or unions. What are some of the things that employees have at their disposal to work through if they have official e issues? Uh, Chad, the, the primary, my primary recommendation would be if an employee doesn't like what his or her first line supervisor is doing, to go up the chain of command. Always use the chain of command. Um, I have perceived that our chain of command is really very, uh, supportive with regard to what is happening to people here with COVID-19. And so I would always first recommend going up the chain of command. Uh, an employee can always go to the inspector general if they don't think they're being treated correctly. People who are part of a bargaining unit can go to their union representatives and bring the issue to the union representatives. And then we have negotiated agreements where they can use procedures in the negotiated agreements um, to dispute something. In addition, there for people who aren't part of a bargaining unit, there's an Army grievance procedure, and they can use the Army grievance procedure. And then there are other categories of um, ways individuals can contest what's being done to them as employees. But I think those are the ones which I would perceive as being most applicable in this situation. Anything else? That was a good answer. Well, thank you, Chad. <laughs> it is. Um, Chad, let me jump in here again. Yes, so, again, an excellent answer um, for garrison employees. An excellent answer, but those are are um, those are methods that can take a lot of time. So, I would just say for garrison employees, if you think you're in that situation, send me an email directly. I'm in the global, 
and we'll try and get a resolution to it as quickly as possible. I, I truly feel that since we're dealing with a crisis, uh, everybody is pretty much on board with this. We know what needs to be done, and we're doing our best to get to where we need to be. So I, I really don't think that, uh, I know that all supervisors are keeping in mind that we don't want to put employees in a dangerous situation. And I don't think that we have yet, but if, if you do feel that way, by all means, please send me an email directly and we'll address it. Thanks. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Peterson, while we got you on the phone, this is more of a general Fort Meade question, but uh, with civilians working in the different spaces, are our cleaning contracts and things of that nature, are they still going to be kept in place uh, during the duration of this? Um, and if an employee in a workspace does get sick, what, what is the uh, general process for, for getting an area cleaned? Or does that fall on the units? Okay, so uh, the first thing I'll answer is about the cleaning contract. Uh, when this is over, one of the things I will be doing is getting in touch with DPW and increasing the frequency in our cleaning contract. Um, Right now, I believe it's you, twice a week your offices get cleaned. Uh, we are going to try and get the contract modified so that we can get cleaning moved up to daily. Now, I've got to tell you, this is a, cleaning is an expensive proposition. So one of the things I want to look at is we have some offices that everybody is teleworking. If everybody is teleworking, we'll go in and deep clean that office, and then it needs to basically stay locked. There should be no reason for anybody to go back into it. So we can we can look at the areas where we still have people and increase the frequency of cleaning there, and we can look at the areas where we've uh, significantly reduced the amount of people coming in, and we can reduce the amount of cleaning there. I think between that, we'll, we'll get a good balance. Now, employees personally, whether it's at home, or, or in the office. Uh, there are measures that you can take, wiping down your keyboard, your phones, things that you touch routinely, tabletops, desktops. Um, those are all things that you can do on your own. And in addition to that, we will provide to our contractors a, a cleaning of the office on a more frequent basis. Thanks. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Williams, if you could just uh, can you expound a little bit on, um, so hiring is still happening. CPAC is still running and things of that nature, correct? That's correct. We're, st we're still um, hiring people. Um, individuals of an organization want someone to begin working. We're still processing those actions to bring them on board to work. However, there is a stop movement in place, which means if an individual is relocating from outside of the um, local commuting area, we're not bringing them on board. But that's an organization um, decision. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so as we've gotten there, we've gotten in about a, a half hour of questions. So now I know, Mr. Dozier, as we're getting ready to wrap up here, you had some things that, uh, uh, a hodgepodge, if I remember your words correctly, of things that you wanted to bring up. So. If you could start off our, our closing comments and just remember as your questions get asked in the thread we are going back and we will be answering questions that didn't get answered farming them out to our organizations that can provide the appropriate answer over the next 48 hours so um, and we get to that Mr. Dozier if you could start our closing round of comments that would be greatly appreciated. Chad thanks. I don't think I answered your question with regard to what documents do people need with regard to sick leave. In general, you need doctor's certificates, but OPM guidance uh, gives us a lot of flexibility, so I wanted to put that in. Uh, with regard to the three-day rule, sort of where after three days you're supposed to bring in a doctor's certificate, you, uh, OPM in this situation really puts the burden on the supervisor to decide what's sufficient evidence to say that an individual should be put in a sick leave status. Okay. But otherwise, I suggest supervisors look out for the employees with regard to documentation. Uh, some of my answers are really focused on uh, having flexibility because I very strongly believe in flexibility. With regard to hodgepodge sort of questions or answers or comments that I have, um, I think bosses should always be asking their employees what kind of concerns they have. 
<clears throat> bosses should get those questions and then give all the employees the answers to them. So I, I strongly encourage supervisors who I'm supposed to be advising to reach out to your employees and ask what's going on. Um, uh, I also recommend that uh, bosses try to lead from the front. I know in my case, my bosses, uh, who are both military officers, are coming into the office and sending all the civilians home. So I deeply respect them for doing that, that they're kind of leading from the front in that respect. Uh, I also advise supervisors to be very, very reasonable with regard to time cards and implementing time cards. Again, remembering that you have regular, leave sick, leave annual, admin leave, I think TN is what we're using for this situation, mostly, and your telework, of course. Uh, we can always go back and correct time cards. I'm not sure how much time we have to go back and correct them. I know I've corrected time cards that are perhaps two months old, maybe more. I just don't know what the limit is on going back to correct time cards if we get, the, get it wrong. But as long as you're doing it in good faith and trying to get it correct, I, I don't imagine anybody will in the long term criticize you. So you brought, you brought that up, and this just reminded me of another question we got that's really quick. Um, may seem common sense, but as life moves on, employees could still take regular leave. Like, so if their employee has to, if you have to take the kid to a doctor or something like that, even in these times, employees can still take. Absolutely. Okay. That's correct. So if I'm teleworking and I need to go to a doctor's appointment, for the time that I'm away from teleworking, I should put in a, a sick leave request. If I want to go out in the backyard during the day and cut the grass, I should put in a leave annual request for that period of time. So just because you're teleworking doesn't mean the other normal leave rules don't apply anymore. Yes, can I make a comment as well on that? Mm -hmm. So if individual is teleworking and there's children in the house that need to be cared for or um, an adult, um, and you have to step away to take care of them, that time should not be charged to your regular work time. It should be charged to some form of leave as well. Thank you. Um, I would say to supervisors, share information with your employees. It helps to dispel rumors. It also creates a stronger team, I think, when you do that, when you share information. Um, and. We don't have all the answers here today, but I'm, I think Chad mentioned that uh, as questions come in, he'll put them into a format which is available to everyone so people have access to the answers. Uh, and I guess my last topic is with regard to employee dozier, because uh, I've talked about being a supervisor and an advisor, uh, but as an employee, uh, I would like to make sure everybody knows as an employee, I'm thankful for my job, I'm thankful for having good bosses, for being able to supervise. Uh, good people and the opportunity that everybody seems to be implementing to, to carry on and uh, so with that that's sort of the end of my comments with regard to uh, hodgepodge all right thank you very much cousin Jeff dr. Wood do you have anything that uh, you'd like to send out to the employees I really don't the, the CPAC is business as usual although folks are working remotely um, our emails our phone numbers are working and we're responding to inquiries from managers and employees okay mr. Peterson anything that you'd like to add or, or say to your employees sure just uh, again to clarify my answers uh, apply to garrison employees uh, specifically because you are the only ones that I really control to add on to what uh, Dr. Williams said and what uh, Mr. Dozier said, I, as I said in the beginning, let's all remember that we're federal employees so that there are certain laws that we have to abide by. Uh, I know it might seem unreasonable to some, but uh, the rules about when you're teleworking and you have to take time out to take care of uh, a child or, or do something other than work, there's requirements to code that time differently to code it as in an appropriate leave status. And, and again, to expand on what uh, Mr. Dozier said, uh, unlike the civilian sector where we see a lot of people who have been laid off from their jobs or are unable to work because they were in the service industry or some other industry that's directly affected by this, no one in the garrison, no one at Fort Meade that I'm aware of will lose their job over this. Um, the paychecks will continue. We'll have an appropriate status for you, either reporting to duty, telework.
working on admin and safety leave, but no one is going to lose their jobs at Fort Meade. Thank you. That's the best news I heard all day, Mr. Peterson. Thank you for that. Because I was a little worried about myself, not anybody else. But um, So, everybody, thank you very much for attending today's event. Um, COVID is here. We, we are doing our best, and really the public affairs and the garrison's mission, or what the garrison has directed us as a public affairs office, uh, is supporting the information with the best information possible. We will not be able to answer everything here, but a big part for today was to just get it up and start getting the questions that you had. So as I reiterated a couple times, we will be back on the thread answering questions that did not get brought up today. Um, and with that, we are continuing to develop a civilian specific frequently asked question list that we will post on our Facebook page next to our general frequently asked question list but also on the Fort Meade COVID page. So home.army.mil slash mead. Click on COVID right in the banner that will take you to the COVID page. And right there, that's where you're getting the list of services that are ongoing or being impacted. You also get the latest OPM guidance and things from there. I'd also encourage you to please continue to uh, log into the Facebook. I mean, as this thing escalates and moves, where do we go up? to an HPCon level or as we start ratcheting down at some point when we do get through this, the Facebook page, that COVID page and the website, and of course the Fort Meade app will be um, your places to go. A uh, couple of general things that you can look on there, the new shop ed hours and the new commissary hours that are implemented starting tomorrow uh, have been posted on there. Uh, for you to get to, obviously, the latest updates with, we're now down to one child development center for Mission Essential and School Age Services Center. All that information can be on our Facebook page, and it's also on our COVID page for the website. And then for anything immediate, check to the Fort Meade app to get that information. Um, along with that, continue to follow CDC guidance. You're my coworkers too. Uh, monitor social distancing. Keep asking questions. And again, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Dozier, Dr. Williams, thank you all very much. It's the first time we did something like this. Um, and I really appreciate you guys coming out and helping sharing information with the community. Thank you. All right, we good? I think so. I heard the bang. All right, what y'all think? Interesting. So it wasn't clear to me, but I thought I heard Mr. Peterson confirm that we're at Mission Essential right now. Yeah, that. I think I thought we were there, and we had been operating as a garrison at Mission Essential only, and those who couldn't the fifty-fifty work shift. I don't know if there's been a new designation since then that we've heard. Okay. Um, but that's what we put out on Wednesday. The, the colonel was like, mission essential only. Those who can't uh, because of their jobs, telework, or maximum telework, mm -hmm. those who can't would be put on 50-50 shifts. But I heard him say as of today, yeah. being restricted to go into your workplace. So that, that, was the part, that was the only part that was new to me was if you're on... I, I thought it was only the people who are on the health and safety leave that would be prohibited from coming into a workplace, but that's, I, what, that's I what he said. I thought. Okay, I don't know if he was if he was bleeding into mm -hmm. the fraggle that he got today. Uh, yeah, that yeah, talks about the Pentagon sure and the North ca the uh, National six, Capital six, Region. Six, sure. That might be something we want to clarify, on. though, because if I'm teleworking, yeah. and I, I heard that, I wonder whether I'm allowed to come back to my workplace. Well, and then if I try, I'll find out, right? If I can get through the gate or not. So I just don't know. Oh, were, the, so. were, the, were the questions okay? I mean, what he's saying does make sense. Yeah, one that had to do with like, am I going to get paid back for CDC? Yes. So it'll be all clear. And somebody else was coming in, and I said, well. Yes, there are forms, but that was if you're voluntary. Right now. Leaving. Right now, before so a couple of reasons, one, we've told people that, you know, And then, you know, some of us, like, you, you need to ask your CDC because this is a very personal question. Yeah. Put it on question. Yeah. Um, 
to put you on know, the, one of the, desk. you know, um, people are my work and my husband's acting duty, what am I supposed to do to take care of my kids' question? So, yeah. Um, that may be something that we want to clarify. Yeah, I mean, nothing we haven't seen before, really. Out there now. So, we were able to answer all the questions you open actually in the feed. It looked like Mary or somebody else was also called in answering questions. So, whatever. My staff is telling me that as long as your computer is plugged in on third Wednesdays or Thursdays, whichever night it is, we can get any updates that might be they pushed out? They push the updates on Tuesdays and Thursdays. What Chief Briggs told us, I know the legal administrator, yeah. she works with the NAC a lot. She said most updates should take as long as you're VPNing in at least twice a week. Okay. But she said there's always the risk. Uh, even if you come in and put it on the desktop, there's always the risk that it will get quarantined because I guess with VPNs, there's even more chance that the updates will all take. It all depends kind of on the strength of the signal. And then some wild things happen. So like one of our paralegals, Ms. Scully, this morning she went to log her computer and the VPN has disappeared. Mm -hmm. So they must have done some kind of updates and the updates dropped the VPN off. Well, without the VPN, 